That's quite a lot of damage, isn't it? I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> yes, it's left a bit of a trail. So 30% of all the unpleasant emissions we release every year are from ground transport. And you know, we've done loads of stuff about electric cars and we know they produce less. And we know that there's electric bikes and electric vans making deliveries. But everything we buy is transported to us on massive, heavy diesel trucks. We're all implicated in that, no matter how eco and green you try and be. And yet this could be the answer to that. And the thing is also, is that commercial vehicles drive about five times more miles than passenger vehicles. So the potential for positive impact is absolutely huge. But there are still some questions. So we've come to Millbrook to put some of those questions to Mercedes. And what's more, Imogen, they're letting me drive it. Do they know what I'm like? Like fully charged? You'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Come and join us in Harrogate, Farnborough and Vancouver. Remember, energy and transport professionals go for free. This is the first time I've ever driven an art, what we would call in the UK an articulated lorry or a, a semi-truck. I don't know how you do it. But I've got a feeling, because there isn't this hugely complex gear stick here, it's going to be a little bit easier than driving a diesel one, but uh, this is a first. Mercedes have brought down three lorries for us to have a look at. The E-Actros 400, E-Econic 6 chassis cab, and the one Robert is currently in, E-Actros 300, with a big, big trailer. Oh, stuff's happening. Oh, lights are coming on. Oh. All three of these lorries are currently being used by fleets for regional and national distribution and also specialist applications like waste management. Oh Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Anyway, back to Robert driving a massive truck. Oh my God. I don't even know because I thought I should steer. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Don't overdo it. Just take it nice and straight to as close to that oh, as possible. Oh, I see. That's it. Goodness gracious me. I mean, what I'm seeing out the back is just... Because then we're going to go terrible. around to the right. So we need to go really out there and round to not go over the gravel, I'm assuming. Ideally, Are yeah. we clear? Yeah, yeah, you've yeah. got nothing coming this way. Uh, oh, no, I see. I'm pretty clear for that. You are I can indeed. see now where the... That is fascinating. I mean, Sweet. that is so different yeah. <laughs> to a car. But I've got to say, my one experience of driving a large truck was a diesel manual, with, I think, 20... Four gears 24 gears, yeah, just in twin splits. So by now I would have changed gear probably three times, four times, you know, yeah. just to get up to this speed. This is the Eoconic chassis cab. And we have actually seen one of these fairly recently on the show when we visited Lunas, although that was a retrofit. And this has been designed totally from the ground up to be electric. And that has a couple of benefits because with that ground up design, that allows for total optimization for that electric powertrain, including a couple of bits and pieces. So there are three 112 kilowatt hour batteries that are spanning the entire width of the chassis cab. And that means that you can get a very nice even distribution of weight that's gonna help things like driving dynamics and optimizing your center of gravity. There are two twin motors located in the E-axles. That also drives that efficiency because you haven't got a need for a prop shaft. You're actually rotating the motors in the direction of travel. There's a special transmission, meaning two forward gears and two reverse gears. We also have the benefit of not having a diesel engine underneath that chassis cab. So that means fewer vibrations, less noise for the driver and passengers, making this an overall much more enjoyable experience. In terms of efficiency, we're looking at 0.64 miles per kilowatt hour. So certainly low when you compare it to a passenger electric vehicle, but pretty good when you compare it to other electric trucks. So the range of the trucks varies from, because that's the other thing that I don't know as a non-truck person, is how, I just assume all trucks do like, 500, 1,000 miles a day, every day, that's what they always do. But from what I've been hearing this morning, that's not always the case. 
Yes, so with our eActros 300, um, it's got a 300 kilowatt hour battery pack that will take you more than 180 miles. And so far with the regional distribution, it covers the range that is needed for the day and returns to base and charge overnight or right. during the day. But when you say regional distribution, that means like within like maybe one or two cities quite close to each other, not, not long haul along a, a freeway or... Correct. Yeah. Um, but if the customer needs more range for their applications, we can upgrade the battery to eActros 400 that has right. four battery packs. That will add an extra 80 miles. And now with our new eActros 600, we can cover up to more than 300 miles. So then the one thing we do know is that the batteries are heavier than the, the, the traditional vehicles. Does that impact the, the sort of volume of stuff you can carry and the weight of stuff you can carry? So most customers I've met are capped by volume rather right. than weight. And maybe right. you've seen them on the motorway, the trucks are quite high. That's because there's a volume constraint more than a weight constraint. Right. But even so, legislation allows us, because of the batteries, to add one more ton above uh, legislation on electric trucks. Right. So, so uh, you're allowed to have a slightly heavier truck on the road. This is, this is to do with the law, not to do with anything else. You're allowed to have that because it's an electric truck. Correct. Right. One more ton. Right, one more ton. And does that mean then you can carry one... No, it doesn't really mean you can carry one less ton. It's really confusing because you could have five tons of bread, which would probably fill this whole truck. So it depends what you're carrying, I guess, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does depend on what you're carrying. And as I said, a lot of customers are capped because of volume yeah. rather than weight. Yeah. So I'm now driving along a long straight road, which is a great relief because it's quite challenging driving these things. But enormous fun, and it's just changed gear. It's got two gears, not 24 like the last one I drove. So smooth, so quiet, so easy. I mean, we're only doing 35, 36 miles an hour. We're not going at like motorway speeds, but it's just gorgeous. And you can see how much, what's great is I can see how much power I'm using. So at the, at the moment, it's set up for the maximum power of the, that the truck has available. I take my foot right off, immediately start regenning, getting power back. And if I increase that, it's like putting the brakes on. You have so much control. So if you're doing a long drive and you're going down a long hill somewhere, you could control your speed and maintain your speed really without touching the brakes, which is, of course, a big advantage. But imagine how much weight there is in this truck and how much momentum you've got. So once you're moving, you're regenerating an enormous amount of power which is one of the reasons that trucks probably are going to end up going a little bit further than people estimate rather than a little bit less. Certainly the early experience people have had with large heavyweight trucks is, you know, the regen is way more than they thought. But we're now going, oh, I see, round the corner. Oh, this is scary now. <laughs> and a squirrel's just run out of the way. I've got to go at a maximum of 40 miles an hour and I'm doing 28. And I'm very proud that I'm not going incredibly fast. I have been round this corner very, very quickly. It's a banked corner. And that feels weird. I just want to, all I'm worried about all the time is not letting the trailer hit the barriers or cutting a corner too sharp because you've got this enormous thing behind you. But actually I can see in these incredible camera mirrors, it's so much better than a glass mirror. You know, when I first saw um, camera mirrors on uh, in cars, it was like, well, it doesn't really make sense and one is bit, all a bit daft. This makes enormous sense. This is so much better than having a glass mirror. This is a proper improvement. Now we know that fleet managers really interrogate the total cost of ownership of vehicles, how much they cost to purchase, how much they cost to operate, and how much they cost to maintain. But when you buy these electric vehicles up front, they do cost 2.5 times more than their diesel counterparts. However, there are so many other benefits we need to consider here. The lower cost of running and maintenance, the more pleasurable experience for the drivers, available grants, and of course, no emissions at the tailpipe. Therefore, it is predicted that fleet owners will break even earlier with an electric vehicle as opposed to a diesel. And then the other thing that, that I'm all very aware of is if you can charge your car at home, one, you can charge it cheaper anyway, but if you do have solar, then you can charge it effectively for very, very little. Is that, I mean, because then I have seen in other countries you know, large depots with enormous amounts of solar on the roof because they're charging mm -hmm. a lot of electric vehicles. Is that something that's starting to happen here? We always recommend a depot charging solution right. first over public charging. And when it comes to depot charging, just pulling power from the grid, it tends to be even more cheaper than using diesel and public electric public charging. Right. 
Um, adding onto that solar and battery storage will help lower the bill and break even the TCO even earlier. So yes, definitely, if customers are looking to install solar and battery storage, it does maybe come with a higher investment cost, but eventually you'll break even much earlier and faster. Making these vehicles electric, we've seen that there aren't really any significant challenges there. It does not impact their capability whatsoever. But when it comes to charging them, there are still some questions and some challenges to answer. And companies like Mercedes are working with charging partners like EO Charging to try and figure some of this stuff out. When it comes to depot operations, that again is reasonably straightforward. The real challenges come when we start to look at the public infrastructure. There's first of all the practical considerations, making sure that actually you've got adequate height to allow these vehicles to come in, that you've got a num uh, enough bays and you've got enough power on site. But whenever we put a video out like this, we know that people are going to jump to the worst case scenario. And what is that worst case scenario? Well, let's assume that something like this, the EACTROS 400, is driving at 56 miles an hour for four hours. After four hours, that driver has to take a break for 45 minutes. So what can happen in that 45 minutes? How much charge do you actually need? Well, to get that 250 miles, you'd be looking at a charging speed of about 500 kilowatts. And we are seeing people start to move towards this megawatt charging. However, this is currently has a top charging speed of 160 kilowatts. So certainly isn't going to give you that 250 miles of range in that 45 minute break. So there are some questions still to ask, but we have to remember that is a worst case scenario. And actually these operations that drivers are doing, that fleets are doing are way more nuanced than that. And there are so many more opportunities to think about charging whilst you stop rather than stopping whilst you charge or stopping for that charge. Every single depot is different, every single fleet and the way the fleets are actually operating is very unique. So um, it is definitely not a one size fit all and um, you know, the, the depot is actually only one part of the solution. Um, we, you know, we talked about earlier, actually uh, for a lot of these truck operators, depot charging clearly is, is super efficient but actually they're going to also need off-site charging facilities, maybe off-site near the depot because they haven't got the amount of power they need or the right amount of land in terms of size, but also they might need on-route charging as well. So it's a very holistic conversation and um, our advice clearly is to do that right up front at the point at which you're thinking about trans transitioning to EV. I mean, one of the things you definitely do when you're a lorry driver is concentrate. I've got that much because, my goodness, you've really got to keep your eye on what's going on. Whoa, because there's a bit of a curb on the right-hand side and gravel on the left-hand side. I don't want to go onto the gravel, but I don't want to go onto the curb. Oh. But what is extraordinary is how quiet, you know, I know it's bloody obvious that an electric truck's going to be quieter, but how quiet it is in here. I'm not having to raise my voice at all. It's really lovely and quiet. The drive is so smooth and there's no vibration. There's no heat coming off the engine for one thing. So it's really, it's, it's a very pleasant experience. So which driving mode are you in at the moment? Is it in power still? It's in power. Good, good. Is that, oh, that's good, is it? Yeah, because we're going to go up onto the uh, mountain. Oh, right. The Alpine course. Oh, my Lord. So. Wow, this is... It's, it's suddenly, when you, I've driven around this in a car, you don't think twice about the slope, but in this thing, I'm thinking, oh my God, that is quite a steep slope. Now I'll go around the outside one, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, you end up cutting it either way, but uh, yeah. slow and steady is the... Uh... I'm quite proud of my, the fact that I haven't dragged the rear wheels yeah. literally through the bushes yet. <laughs> It'll grow back. Well, no, I was just driving this truck, just a truck, driving in here. I mean, it's, it's quite a tight turn, but I mean, any truck driver worth their salt, no problem. Slight adjustment of the bank. I mean, I see it as really as landscaping. I think what we've shown today that if you meet someone who says, oh, electric trucks won't work, not battery electric, it's got to be diesel or it's got to be 
you know, biofuel or something. They're wrong. Just stop talking to them, ignore them, turn your back, walk away very rudely because this technology works and it works really well. And I guess you could argue that the one small stumbling block at the moment is the public charging infrastructure for trucks. So the, the trucks at the depots, there's no problem. The companies, the private companies that run all these trucks, they can sort that out. There's enormous amounts of solutions for them, but we do need a charging infrastructure that trucks can use out on the highways and freeways of the world. But imagine if all the trucks in the world were electric and not diesel. I think we can all agree it would probably be a nicer place to live. I'd just quickly like to thank Mercedes who've arranged all this today. We've had great fun driving their trucks and uh, that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching.